Bom dia. Eu falo um pouquinho de espanhol, espero que o português não. Lo siento, por eso. I will try and speak slowly. I am known as someone who wanders around and gesticulates wildly. I will, I will do my best to communicate clearly. I lost my light, uh, but I guess you need that. possible to is it possible to have a small light just one bank so no it's it's okay it's okay ah perfecto for me it is a great honor to be able to speak to the Sim Symposio Texarc Associate Brazil and to come to Curitiba. I would like to thank uh, yeah, the president, Ivan da Costa Marques, for inviting me, as well as the vice president, uh, Gilson uh, Kelus, uh, and for helping getting me to Curitiba as well. Uh, thanks also to uh, Decio de Nascimento and all the members of the Comissão Organizadora. Thanks also to uh, Georgia Alana Nowakowski for hosting my partner Marta and me since our arrival. And finally, uh, thanks to Raquel uh, Scheitze and her team for simultaneous translation. This is my first experience with simultaneous translation. And Raquel, where are you? If I, is it in the box? Ah, okay, in the box. Okay. So if I speak too quickly or I am unclear, just wave and I will try to clarify. Obrigado. I left out one person the policewoman by the train station who gave me her pink ribbon when I asked her where I could find one. We know that much medical science is gendered. My partner Marta's mother died of breast cancer. And so pink October is very important to me. Now, let me say, STS in the Estados Unidos and in Europe, and also in South America, Latin America, I think that's yes. Developed, STS, CTS, CTSA, developed and gained legitimacy by critiquing the linear model of knowledge, creation, diffusion, and utilization. And yet, and yet most STS, CTS publications, I know more about STS than CTS, I have read some in Spanish. Publications perform and celebrate precisely that. We critique the linear model and yet we perform it and celebrate it. This for me is a problem. So allow me to offer my alternative uh, vision to that. My starting point is my favorite quote from Antonio Gramsci, 1932. Is a philosophical movement, namely STS, CTSA, properly so called when it is devoted to creating a specialized culture, an este cuarto, among restricted intellectual groups, STS, CTS, or rather when and only when in the process of elaborating a form of thought superior to common sense 
or thought to be superior to common sense, and coherent on a scientific plane, it never forgets to remain in contact with the simple, or what I think of as popular theorizing, which is not simple, which provides the source of the problem and makes it a philosophical movement. Only by this contact does a philosophy become historical, purify itself of intellectualistic elements of an, uh, of, an uh, of an individual character and become life. This is my theme, becoming life. Can scholarship in STS, say, say essay, become life? Can it move beyond creating a specialized culture among restricted intellectual groups and become historical? Can it purify itself of intellectualistic elements of an individual character? What would, what would this mean? And to whom? What would it take to accomplish? And for whose benefit? Writing in 1932, Gramsci was trying to figure out how intellectuals might be able to mobilize the masses. What is at stake and indeed at risk when STS, CTSA, scholarship, scales up to engage the practices of anyone, including ourselves, who draws upon and lives our, their lives or our lives through dominant images of science and technology. Since this is the opening lecture for an STS or TechSoc Associate Brazil symposium, I thought I would try provoking you. I want to provoke you to re-examine what are you doing here? Why are you here? Why is this meaningful to you? Why are you contributing to Cete Esse? What do you hope to accomplish by means of Cete Esse? Or to invoke Gramsci's sense of the necessary connection between knowledge, the making of knowledge or expertise and normativity what is STS CTS for? What are STS CTS scholars for? What are STS CTS symposia for? I am offering here an argument for doing our jobs better as STS scholars. And I am borrowing here from Professor Michael Lynch of Cornell's uh, article, an ironic piece called Science as a Vacation. Mike argues that we should focus on doing our jobs. My argument differs. I am making a case for expanding what we count as significant in our jobs. Or perhaps, as I learn more from CTSA practices in Brazil, and other Latin American countries to perhaps move STS in the United States and Europe more in the direction of, say, te esse in Latin America. I want to grant formal attention and higher status to practices that ST, uh, STS, say, te esse scholars all engage in but tend not to value highly enough at our meetings, at our congresses, at our symposia. It involves doing critical analysis in ways that genuinely have a chance, in Gramsci's terms, of scaling up to become realities among audiences and in locations that are now relying upon dominant images of science and technology that we criticize. I call this big STS, big CTSA. Little STS stops with critique. Critique is essential. Critique is important. Critique is not enough. Big STS extends critique into critical participation. This past Saturday, I became president of the 
for us, the Society for Social Studies of Science. I have been accepting condolences. <laughs> this is not easy work, and I want to try and redirect a large ship. The theme of my presidency is critical participation. Now, what is critical participation? It helps me to think about it as method. One of the things that I have found and many have found most powerful about actor network theory is that actor network theory is not really a theory. It's more of a method. So if you will allow me to be too brief, too cryptic, let me say, let me offer that mo methodologies of STS critique typically include three steps. The first step is to identify what are the dominant images of technology or science in this particular context. What is given or taken for granted? So for example, technology in the singular is about autonomous developments that become external forces that impact upon us. Science, in the singular, is about creative discovery by creative geniuses that produce truth with a capital T. Critical analysts then turn to make visible what is hidden by these dominant images. Science studies, technology studies, medical studies, engineering studies, this work in, is in critical analysis makes visible what's what's hidden, with the, goal, uh, with the goal of creating, of formulating, of nominating better formulations through such concepts as construction or co-production. And then critique stops because it's been published. And now we move on to the next project. Extending critique into critical participation adds two more steps. What are the specific situated practices? And I learned from Raquel that situated does not translate well. Located, localized practices through which one encounters or engages those that one studies. What are the possible pathways through which one's new formulation that one nominates might scale up alternatives. I will return to the theme of this meeting with this question. Now, formulating our analyses, our theories, our philosophies, including our theoretical accounts, in ways to maximize critical participation to maximize the possibility of scaling up to reality, to maximize the possibilities of becoming life, is tricky work. It is tricky be because it requires not only the researched, the people we research, but also the researchers ourselves to add new identities to ourselves. Adding new identities transforms the identities we already have. In this lecture this morning, I want to focus on the researcher, on us, on you, on me. One of the biggest barriers to effective critical participation is the identity politics of STS, Tete Essay, because this work introduces tensions, the work of critical participation introduces tensions in our identities as scholars. Let me introduce two examples that I would like to use to frame this discussion. The first is the Dutchman Turn Zyderant Girac's work, Contract Research, to improve patient compliance in hemophilia treatment. The development of the of technologies of injectable medication to stop bleeding has effectively or enabled the transfer of treatment from hospitals to homes. 
The problem is, is that medication has to be kept within strict temperature limits. And Turn finds that the, the dominant image in medical settings is what he calls a repertoire of distrust, which is to say people don't do what they're supposed to do. So he was invited in to help. He experimented with what he calls situated, located, localized intervention, which includes knowledge production. This is not just downstream work. It makes visible uh, how the repertoire of distrust works and what it hides. Non-compliance turns out to be complex. It, in it, it includes confusion in the roles of hospital personnel. And let me offer a quick note to Raquel. The text I gave her said that it includes confusion in hospital rules. That's not what I mean. I'm referring to the roles, the jobs of hospital personnel. And what he did was to effectively expand a medical clinic, a nurse's clinic, to include discussing the complexities of co co coordinating different social roles. This is a small, a localized intervention, but to me, this is profound STS work. It ex expanded the definition of the clinic beyond its typical medical boundaries. He has not, however, yet, as he tells me, attempted to challenge the repertoire of distrust that lives among the medical pra practitioners and seek to scale up a new image that would become life among them. The second example is my own current research in which I am making visible normative commitments in the making of engineers and the doing of engineering work. Previous research on engineering problem solving has focused or highlighted on what Wendy Faulkner has called a technical social dualism in engineering. Those who do technology and society will be quite familiar with technical social dualisms and that live especially among engineering communities at technical universities such as this one, or let us say, to pick one at random, Virginia Tech. I am, arguing, uh, I am arguing that this distinction is grounded in a normative vision, a, a vision of engineering helping everyone. And let me draw here from a quote, a quote uh, let me draw a quote from Ken Alder's book, wonderful book, Engineering the Revolution, in which he teases out a definition of engineering work as describing quantitatively the relationship among measurable quantities and then using these descriptions to seek a region of optimal gain. That's the term that grabbed me, optimal gain. Engineers are always seeking optimal gain. What counts as optimal gain? In optimal gain lies normativities and what I think of as directionalities. Mater um, normativities in my terms materialize as directionalities, actual practices that have direction and these we can map. If, if engineering helps everyone, as engineers tend to claim really throughout the world today, there's an unusual movement taking place around the world, a coordinated movement, then engineers do not have to hold themselves responsible for the specific, the localized implications of their work. And this is exemplified in a recent movement at the US National Academy of Engineering called the Grand Challenges for Engineering, the worldwide challenges. And we engineers will help the world by addressing these worldwide challenges. I am trying to show along with others that this commitment is actually multiple. And in my work, I am mapping normative localisms. Um, one way I am doing this 
is by, is by examining the emergence of engineers and engineering knowledge in different countries. And again, to be overly simple, in the US, one finds an emphasis on low cost production for mass consumption. This contrasts with developments in France where there's an emphasis on increasing social order. So it's okay to use nuclear power plants from Westinghouse made in the US, but the French do so in a way that they judge to be orderly, unlike the US. Or in Germany, where a focus is on, on the emancipation of spirit that is God-given, God-given spirit inside must be emancipated, emancipated through preci precision technologies. When I ask my students about what is German engineering, of course, they say BMW, Mercedes. You close the door on a Mercedes and the sound, oomph, oomph. This is, this is not just about a car. This is about this German spirit that's being manifest in the precision technology. Or in Korea, which I am studying now and, and which under Park Chung-hee, anyone who was involved in work on heavy industry in the 1970s, and when they moved from light industry to heavy industry, anyone involved was doing engineering. And so what came to mean engineering in Korea, South Korea, uh, uh, involved uh, participating in heavy industry. And that has created a problem for those who were identified as engineers. In the years since, where, where there's now a focus on, on information, computer technologies, electronics, et cetera. My point being simply that I'm interested in mapping normativities. These are, these are uh, uh, some large terrains I'm talking about, but I am interested in mapping normativities down to this specific project. Now, I got into this work uh, as critique. How do localized dominant images of engineering problem solving work? The way I learned engineering was through a very specific and rigid set of s practices or steps. What is, I solved thousands of problems as an, as an engineering student. All of them began with the word given. This is unusual for STS people. Given is the problem. Find a solution. Figure out which equations apply. Draw a diagram. Do the calculations. Produce the solution. And at Virginia Tech, you draw a box around the solution. At Lehigh, where I went, you drew two lines under the solution. What does this image and this and, and this image, the dominant images of engineering problem solving, do vary from place to place? I would be interested in, in understanding how one learns engineering here. But as critique, my focus is, was on what do these hide? And also, how does learning did learning these practices shape me, challenge and shape me as a person? I found out that they did when I became a department head. And part of me is engineer, and part of me is anthropologist. The engineer was rigorous in organizing everything and solving all, everything all at once. The anthropologist was supposed to be listening to everyone. I became more engineer than, an, engin, than anthropologist, but I was schizophrenic, and I am schizophrenic, but so are you. Am I right? You have these two sides. That's why you came here. This side wasn't enough. You had to do this. Passion was over here. The, wait, the heart's over here. So this engineering should be here. Uh, uh, anthropology is over here because the heart. We come for the heart. Understanding that engineering practices filled with normativities raised for me the question of critical participation. Now, permit me a quick aside. Oh, by the way, that's my transcript <laughs> uh, at Lehigh. And 
I argue for a transcript model of engineering education because a transcript model treats each of the engineering sciences as a distinct, um, as a dis uh, as distinct world. And so students are collecting these beautiful worlds with beautiful practices and, the, and each is individual. Each student transcript is individual. This is much more interesting than the faculty models of what counts as a quality engineering education, which I think I'm going to show you momentarily. But let us go on to a quick aside. So this picture, I am interested in critical participation. I started by focusing on technology and technology studies. My career came through technology studies, especially controversies over technology. And I went into a project analyzing the development of computer-aided design with an idea that engineers might be a vehicle for helping to scale up new images of technology. And that is because in computer-aided design, computer-aided design was confusing engineers. In engineering, you learn to control. You walk into each class, you know nothing. You are powerless. This is very masculinist. And you learn, you take tests, you solve problems, and you come out in, in control. There's mastery of the science. But as soon as you introduce the computer, computer-aided science, sorry, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, control becomes impossible. And for me, this one image was uh, provided an icon for the, for the problem. And that this is an image from a, from a, a, text, a, uh, a guide and ins a instruction manual produced by IBM for its software, CADM. And what it is trying to tell the user is that when you sit down at this chair, you being a white male who has no other identity, you are neutral, a person with no other parts of your identity. When you sit there, and if you are a woman, you must forget that. If you are not white, you must forget that. If you are white and you care that you're white, uh, sorry, if you are a white male, and you care that you're a white male and are interested in what it means to be a white male, a privileged white male, as I am, white and male and tall, I have many, and from the states, I'm loaded with privileges that I did not earn. That's not me. And that's, that's the, I have to strip all that away. You have to I eliminate all of that to sit down and work because you have to be able to get into the machine. Inside the machine is another white male so the second white male is, a, is an image of the algorithm uh, that IBM created so that when you are uh, drawing a D uh, uh, using the CADM software, you are not working on a tiny screen. You are actually working on a large 20,000 inch by 20,000 inch drawing board. And inside is a little man who is who is projecting images onto the screen for you. The point being that, that learning CADM, learning CAD CAM um, is, and this I documented in this Machine and Me book, is difficult for engineering students who just want a tool or who just want control. The computer resists. And I came into this project thinking perhaps Maybe engineers, because engineers claim jurisdiction over technology. If technology, then engineers. I was, I was, I was following engineers incorrectly. What I learned is that I'm not going to be able to transform the dominant image of technology through engineers. But it fueled my passion over here, fueled my passion for intervening critically, for critical participation among engineers in, in this dominant image of control. Now, that was an aside, uh, just a little bit of background. This is TechSoc and Esosite. I wanted you to know that in addition to the critical participation work and engineering studies work, I've, I'm also interested in technology studies work. 
but haven't focused on technology for a little while. Back to the main story. Okay, critical participation in engineers, uh, in engineering, education. What does that mean? How does one do this? Because uh, when you teach a course as a faculty member from the humanities or the social sciences, you are already irrelevant. And I d so I developed a class over a period of 10 years called Engineering Cultures. Now this confuses students because it has the word engineering in it. So students come because it is the least irrelevant course in the humanities and social sciences. Maybe. I taught other, uh, there's a longer story and I have only so much time. <laughs> Uh, but I spent a, a, a decade developing a course. I, I used to teach courses in which I would have students, um, oh, and let me also say that students come to us in the humanities and the social sciences knowing that what we have are opinions. And the challenge for them is to fi figure out what's the opinion of the instructor? Do I agree or do I disagree? I want to get an A so I will figure out what the uh, instructor's opinion is, and then make sure that I respond in a way that the instructor is happy. This did not make me happy. I developed classes in which I had students perform. I always make students talk. Engineers hate this. Uh, they have to talk about themselves, and I had and they have to perform. We do role modeling and perform controversies. And after a while, they like this, and they they say. Uh, that this this is uh, you know this is fun this is interesting this is important they give me high evaluations and I become known as a strong teacher however I am very unhappy because when they go back to engineering they have nothing to carry with them I have given them nothing except fun over there in the humanities and social sciences so for ten years I thought how can I formulate a course that gives them something that they can take back with them into engineering. And that became this course called Engineering Cultures. In Engineering Cultures, which now I teach with 150 students and teaching assistants, um, I could memorize the names of students up to 75 students. But when I reached 95 students, I could no longer memorize all the names because in the back of the auditorium, are a large group of white males with hats that are five feet, 10 inches tall, and I, they became a homogeneous group. So I could not, I could not un learn their names. And the only way for this course to work is if someone knows your name. So I train people who know the students' names and they work with small, small groups. This makes me sad because I'm usually on a stage um, instead of in a small class, which I much prefer. But this course, um, if you're going to persuade engineers to learn how to work with people who define problems differently than they do, engineers are notorious for not being able to do this, how do you do this? It occurred to me, you do this by starting with engineers, by helping them to understand that what it means to be an engineer and what counts as engineering knowledge has varied, and uh, expertise, has varied dramatically from place to place. So I take them on world trips, metaphorically, and help them to see this. And through a series of practices and a methodology that I call location, knowledge, and desire, that they do repeatedly over and over again, um, I'm helping them learn to work effectively with engineers and non-engineers who define problems differently than they do. What I am mapping out are practices of problem definition. They learn problem solving. I teach collaborative problem definition. Now, be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. I, um, along, I've developed a, a book series in which um, I have many contracts out, out right now in which people are writing books about what it means to be an engineer in different countries. If any of you are interested in writing about 
the emergence of engineers and engineering education and what it means to be an engineer in Brazil, or if non-Brazilians are in the room, um, please approach me. I need a book on Brazil. Um, yeah. So the first step in critical participation is to, try is to develop a course, localized, situated. Um, but then it occurred to me that what I was doing in class actually could be quite effective across engineering more generally. And so I became more ambitious, or a bit crazy, you might say. This work identified a pathway for contesting technical social dualism by, by calling it, its attention to it as a native category. It is an engineer's category. So I formulated, and I am now attempting to scale up to reality, to become life, an image of engineering that includes collaborative problem definition. The dominant image is that engineers um, solve, uh, apply engineering sciences to solve problems to produce technological designs. It's their own linear model. I am adding on the front end collaborative problem definition, which to engineers seems a little bit weird, but not too radical. Yes, we ha you have to define the problem, and yes, you have to work with other people. So, okay, maybe. Sounds a little bit, bit like design, but you know, you're a humanist, this is scary, but let's try. So I am right now, PDS, I'm calling a PDS, engineer, engineering as problem definition and solutions. Now, the two cases. Let us return to STS for a moment more generally. Critical analysis in STS emerged and became dominated in, Euro in the US and Europe, Europe and the US, I should say, uh, in the 1980s around a question. Uh, we congregated around a question. What are the relationships among the technical or the knowledge dimensions of, of science and technology um, and the non-technical or social, cultural, political dimensions of science and technology? And how do these relationships change over time? We cluster different subfields clustered around this common question. And furthermore, STS programs, departments, centers, positions, we gain resources because by addressing this central question, we offer the promise of addressing and solving problems involving science and technology. Hence, we all face the problem of critical participation. So I ask you, what are the implications of your analyses, of your research, for locally dominant images? From my point of view, I think that's the last one. From my point of view, given the huge and growing number of sites where images of technology and science operate, because and especially technology has become ubiquitous, it is everywhere, STS should be huge. In principle, from my point of view, there is no upper limit on the number of sites in all of our countries where this central question is salient. Okay. Yet, STS is small. This is why I had to run for president. This is, makes me sad. STS CTSA programs have spread across the planet. They have gained significant scholarly status. At, e at each institution, ST and yet, at each institution, STS tends to be a relatively small configuration of scholars and activities and relatively marginal 
physical and intellectual spaces. My department is in the oldest building on campus. That's true in many places. Is there passion for expansion? I had a conversation with Gabrielle Hecht in 2011, and I asked her about what are you doing at Michigan, and she explained, quote, we felt at Michigan that STS has enough graduate degree programs. And I asked her, what do you consider to be the STS graduate degree programs in the US? And she said, well, Virginia Tech, Cornell, Rensselaer, San Diego, MIT. Five. Is that enough graduate, uh, STS graduate programs? I say no. So why is this? How could she have that reaction? From my point of view, it is because of the linear model. This is a picture of a book exhibit. Note that it's relatively empty, even at an STS meeting. Most STS scholarship de depends primarily on the linear model for its influence and effectiveness. At the 4S, where here's the program for the 4S from which I just came, we offer awards for books and articles with small print runs and few readers. Even the Rachel Carson Prize, it is, which is for a work of social or political relevance, not necessarily active participation, has, be kind of, has become a kind of second place. In following our question, we have tempted to emphasize creation, responding in two ways. One way in English now, and this happens also, I see it, I see it in Spanish, I don't know about Portuguese. One way is through compound words. Socio-technical, techno-political, techno-science, epist epistemography, socio-material, socio-technical. You make your career if you can invent a good compound word. What are the chances of these compound words scaling up outside the auditorium or as I like to think of it, is outside the hotel because in the, in the States or Europe, we're often in hotels. So we've tended to, we responded in two ways, emphasizing creation. The second way lies in a dominant narrative, a narrative that dominates STS work and our critiques. And it, it lies in the sentence, it's more complex than that. In 1987, I was invited to a local, 1987, right, it's a while ago. I was invited to a local television show that wanted to look at questions of technology and society. And the moderator seemed to embrace technological determinism. And I heard myself saying variations on the theme, it's more complex than that. We had seven minutes. After seven minutes, I left. It was over, the lights went off, and I thought, I've not reached my audience. All I said was, it's more complex than that. We say this a lot in STS, and we say, it's more complex than that because you have not read X, Y, Z, and I have. There's not much chance of this sentence scaling up. It is not enough to tell people that the role of technology in society is complex, nor enough to offer them compound words. I worry that the future of STS, say, say, essay, will not, uh, or that the fields will not survive if its ontological findings and its claims do not scale up into worlds of popular theorizing or common sense or the worlds of the simple as Gramsci put it. At the 4S meeting in Copenhagen last year, Anne-Marie Moll rightly pointed out that to nominate new realities, we have to start with locally, localized, specific work. She said, and where to go, oh, this was about food and the future of science and technology studies, and where to go amidst all this turbulence with the study of mundane cases, such as that of food and its texture, and eaters and their tastes. And then she concluded by saying, not in general, of course, 
but in specific situated practices. It is more complex than that. I claim that for particular audiences who take the certain images of the textures of food for granted that are given, that work with dominant images, that our work, her work, is indeed always general work as well. Scaling up new images to the ontological status of the given or the taken for granted or the real is difficult work. It typically involves a multiplicity of practices, a multiplicity of audiences, and a multiplicity of scales. I couldn't pull it off just with a bunch of engineers studying computer-aided design. This is not easy. Yet, STS is largely invisible beyond its boundaries. All of you know this. You have to explain to your mother what STS is and why you are doing this. My mother would say, I have a pen and paper. Tell me again, what is it that you do? <laughs> oh, OK. And then, tell, I have a pen. David Edge, the founding editor of, so, of Social Studies of Science, in his last presentation at the 4S in, in, two, in 2002, um, made reference to a, um, uh, um, uh, to a very prominent controversy in technology. I'll just leave it at that. And he pointed out the literature and the references, and he said, the author makes no reference whatsoever to the, the STS literature on this topic. That was 2002. The issue remains today. And in my judgment, there's a new danger in a way, and that is that every field of the humanities and the social sciences is taking on science and technology as a topic, integrating it in to the disciplinary predispositions as a category of area studies. Only STS engages, CETA-ESE engages science and technology per se, the dominant images, with the possibility of scaling up alternatives that may be better, which we must justify. Recently, my supervisor, I am fortunate enough to report directly to the provost, he asked me about STS and the schools with PhDs. I mentioned those five. If most schools, do, he said, quote, if most schools don't need STS programs, is the field really necessary? This is my friend. I am married to a veterinarian. We ought, mostly we talk about his dogs. But this day we talked about STS. Why is the linear model so attractive even to us? It has to do, I argue, with our identity politics, focusing on creating ideas, compound words, allows us to imagine ourselves as 100% STS. I create ideas, my ideas diffuse, and I stay put in my safe space, my office, whatever that is. And then when I'm fully successful, my creations have, have moved 100% beyond the academy into the world. And the example I like to use is the concept of culture that came out of anthropology, which left and is now a problem for anthropologists, the way culture is used. I think of this as the ideology of humanist virtuosity, the researcher as virtuoso. But I have developed stakes in the view that how we theorize, how we analyze, shapes our pathways for critical participation in relationship to dominant images. It is just that STS as actually lived produces a variety of tensions. Now, I realize that by raising the issue of critical participation, I am joining an arena that's already filled with contrast and debate, with scholars mapping connections between the critique and engagement through 
concepts such as these, following these practices produces tensions. Each has its own tensions. Each has its own opportunities. Let's, let, us, let us look at our two cases first. Back to turn, Zaydevan Girard. He achieved a crucial intervention, redefining a clinic from the purely medical to include organizational practices. This was a risky move. It transformed his identity from a consultant observer paid as a consultant to a participant. He became a little bit hospital member, mostly STS, partly hospital. But he did not seek to scale up a new repertoire of distrust or to contest distrust. He said no. Too many attachments. Would it remove him from STS, making him too much of a hospital employee and, and disrupt in a way his career in STS? He struggles with this question. We discussed it over four days at my house uh, a few months ago. Likewise, this guy Downey, He's analyzing nor the normative grounds of technical social dualism in engineering. This, as critique, this is comfortable, STS, engineering studies work. But what about making? What about doing? He developed a course that did not just bring STS theory to students, but fitted it in a way to a dominant image of the problem solver. That's what problem definition and problem solution is designed to be. Engineers are also problem definers, hence they must listen to others. But this guy Downey became a little bit engineer in the process. That's okay, because he's a, a, bit, a little bit engineer already. I think as probably mentioned, that I'm trained as a mechanical engineer. Then he developed an online version of this course, which is available for free. This produces a bigger audience, but still preserved his primary STS identity. There are 19 lectures available at this site called Global Hub. Um, I was told that, uh, recently that, that it is rated number two of 190 contributions to the site. So it's popular, it's scaling up in a way, but I stay at home. And then he accepted an invitation to help engineers from Michelin work with their French colleagues. And he ended up being characterized as a consultant. And in the question answer session, if you're interested, I can tell you a story about how an article in, the, in PRISM, which is the magazine of the American Society for Engineering Education, featured me as a prime consultant who helps engineers do what they already want to do. This moment was arguably enormously successful and an act of mediation, but, but he was very uncomfortable. Was he now only partly STS? As he drew or left the parking lot, he thought, I could do this. I could do this many times over. I could leave my job and do this. He could leave his job and do this. Was he becoming part Michelin? Was he becoming a consultant? Who was he? How about the work of scaling up a new dominant image of engineering? Writing articles and short books for engineers, no problem. Giving keynote lectures to engineers, also okay. All discursive stuff. But what about expanding the making of engineers and doing engineering across his own campus? Here is the faculty image of the making of a mechanical engineer. Can't you see, can't you tell? There's lots here that's interesting, that's funny actually, and sad, because all my, I'm over here on the right, the boxes that I teach that are on the right, notice that there are no lines connected to anything else, okay? That is the humanities and social sciences. This is what, this is what students are, I don't need to tell, explain. Should he re try to reorganize the entire engineering curriculum at Virginia Tech? No way. Too many attachments. I would be transformed into a member of that college, which I tried for a while, and then I found myself bored. What will he do if he gets serious requests to participate deeply in the remaking of engineers and engineering? 
how many new identities is he willing to accept? He feels tension. Working with uh, Zyder and Girac, actually, I am beginning to classify different approaches to critical participation. So here are just a few. Informing debate. Informing, if I think of our work, think of your work, think of yourselves now, please, as informing debate. Critical analysis argues that debates over techno science, they tend to be instrumental and insufficiently reflexive. Critical analysis can inform these by, by speaking to them, can open up debate for politically salient issues, um, open up for debate that are overlooked or are made invisible by the promises of progress. And policy can be an important regulatory repertoire. The situated practices used are largely discursive practices, negotiating meanings and evaluating policy. They include organizing public debates, writing blogs, giving public lectures, writing op-ed articles, etc. And there, there are procedural inno innovations that reimagine the identities, positions, and actions of participants. Some of these enable continued distance, some force closeness. Is doing policy analysis real scholarship? Downey says yes. Another, activism, or maybe meta-activism. From this point of view, techno-science is inherently political. I neglected to mention those, you know, the, the pre in the previous slide were public intellectual, negotiating public meetings, consensus conferences, science policy, et cetera. Activism, reconstructivist agendas, mutual enrollment, analysis of undone science, and analyses of social justice and development. Uh, Works such as these maintain that techno science is inherently political with marginalized forces and unheard voices that deserve more attention. Undone science and technology remain marginalized unless they find new allies, and academics might be their allies. The situated practices of STS activism can, can, can take the form of writing about marginalized knowledge to, the, to try to enhance its legitimacy. It can also consist of material interventions among elite populations in order to both make subordinated perspectives more visible and help empower them. There are tensions, once again, some enable distance, some demand or force closeness. We're just beginning a project to map these. Another one, my last one for now, committed experiments. Um, feminist technoscience, constructive technology assessments, sorting attachments, design practices, midstream modulation, artful contamination, and the remaking of engineers and engineering. Am I participating in committed, ex make committed experiments? It sometimes feels that way. Critical analysis, uh, uh, the critical analysis uh, maintains that technoscience is replete with frictions, frictions that lie within. And these frictions can be best articulated by getting involved by with actual productions of, get involved with actual productions of knowledge and technology. The situated practices of the committed ex STS, CTSA experimenter uh, um, can themselves be sites for learning. I am learning by teaching, for example. Yet large political issues in technoscience are located in specific moments of shaping and enrollment and the STS scholar may be surprised by the normativities encountered in practice. It is one thing to put your concepts at risk when you go into the field. It is quite another and often much more difficult to put your politics at risk at the same time. This I think is actually essential at least as a genre of critical participation. So what do we do in STS, say TSA, in general? How to make um, critical participation, legitimate scholarship? The journal I edit, Engineering Studies, has just introduced a new publication called Critical Participation. So let's try and make it legitimate scholarship. I'm president of 4S, 
I'm organizing a committee to introduce new kinds of sessions built around critical making or building of STFs and maybe new, uh, new awards, 4S gives awards. SOT, CTA does not, but I would argue that it should because through when you build awards, when you give awards, people take those awards home and they can build things. Perhaps a, an award for building STS. I'm not going to read to you what this, uh, what articles uh, on critical participation might involve, but we could discuss that. What to do? Make STS bigger, 10 times bigger for the moment, 100 times bigger later, 1,000 times bigger when I have a headstone. How? Undergraduate teams, by blurring our boundaries between being uh, inside a university and outside through consulting activities and firms. I, uh, I've been interacting with Jessica Messman from Maastricht University who does amazing auto auto video autoethnography. Well, at, during the forest meeting, nurses in Maastricht were videotaping themselves and analyzing their practices. We need to make STS bigger. This is why I decided to stand to run for president and at least make these arguments. Let me conclude with one final story. My apologies if I'm offending anyone. Trondheim, Norway. I noticed that the theme of this symposium is a different development, or is a different development possible, I think is what I saw on the way in. This summer, I participated in a workshop on sustainable engineering. Um, and I gave a presentation at a conference. Before the conference, I rented a bicycle and did a bicycle ride all over Trondheim. I like to understand the city. That's why I took the tourist bus yesterday. And it is the best, we have, Kurishiba has the best tourist bus in, in, in any city. It's about 45 kilometers long. If you go all the way out to the Free University of the Environment, um, in a far away, it's, it was really, cool. it's good. Um, I didn't do that in Toronto, I used a bicycle. Well, on the bicycle, I come across this trash can and I stop and I stare at it. It seems to speak to the meeting, sustainable engineering. So I use this image to frame my commentary. Like uh, Cody Chiba, Trondheim is un unknown across Norway for its commitment to environmental sustainability. And the STS scholars at this workshop engaged in both critique and critical participation. There's great interest in environmental sustainability. So this graffiti makes good sense. Se after all, sexual intimacy is better than attempting to dominate the environment which you can't do anyway. But then, if we start thinking about identity politics, it gets more complicated, and the image of development especially calls attention to the ambiguities. Fucking one another is not necessarily a good thing. The dominant image of development imposed arguably, and I think probably I wouldn't find disagreement in this room, imposed from Euro-America, from the United States and Europe, could be seen as exactly that. So when you extend critique to critical participation, you have to multiply. And I'm, I'm wondering, is it, when I see the question, is a de different development possible? Are different developments possible? Might it be the case that in each individual project in which you're working, where there's a locally dominant image that relates to development, might you, you be able to scale up an alternative in that, in that way and then produce collectively challenges where the argument could then be what are the best alternative images of development? So through what specific pathways are you um, challenging some local dominant images. 
What identities are you adding in your work? Might you be nominating and scaling up many developments? Michael Lynch's science is, is a as a vacation is a, is a thoughtful, fine analysis. One cannot exist beyond the fray. Um, Raquel said, what does fray mean in English? Um, beyond the debate, the public debate, beyond the mess, beyond the, the battles. He concludes, doing our jobs at the university demands a temporary vacation from more common modes of engagement. My view is we can never take a vacation. Our analyses always involve ontological politics and identity politics. An important challenge for us is to accept and celebrate adding multiple identities, becoming part STS, Sete Esse, part not STS, Sete Esse. It is difficult when 1,100 papers at last week's 4S meeting in San Diego emphasize the linear model. It is difficult when academic hierarchies still place creation at the top. It is difficult when citations and awards emphasize creation. But my argument is that we cannot take a vacation. But if we do not grant greater legitimacy to critical participation, we could very well get made redundant, be made redundant, and get ourselves fired. Para que? Para quien? Obrigado. If anyone is interested in engineering studies, I will be putting a few of these small cards about the International Network for Engineering Studies outside, as well as some of my business cards if you would like to contact me. Or if you would like to talk afterwards, please let, approach me. Vamos ter 15 minutos para perguntas. Gary vai ouvir as perguntas em inglês e, e responder. De modo que, se alguém quiser fazer perguntas... Renato? Então, é, muito obrigado. A, a sua palestra é muito oportuna nesse momento no Brasil, na América Latina. Eu fiquei pensando, ao longo da sua palestra, o que, que seria para nós, nesse momento, é, uma crítica participativa. Né? A, a critical participation. O que, que seria isso? Na América Latina, você sabe, nós temos em vários países, governos que tentam romper com o neoliberalismo, com uma maneira de gerir os nossos países de uma forma autoritária, injusta e excludente. Não obstante isso, esses governos mantêm as políticas relativas ao conhecimento com uma clara orientação neoliberal. 
Lamentavelmente, a nossa política de ciência e tecnologia, a nossa política de ensino superior, na maior parte desses países, se mantém inalterada. Os estudos CTS, me parece, têm uma é, imensa fronteira de participação crítica nesse sentido, porque nós, mais do que outros setores, do que outros campos do conhecimento, temos a possibilidade de atuar no sentido de mudar as políticas de conhecimento nos nossos países. Mudar a política de ciência e tecnologia, mudar a política é, universitária. É, Bottom-up e top-down. Dentro do nosso dia a dia, dentro da nossa sala de aula, do nosso laboratório, como engenheiros, como professores, e também intervindo junto ao movimento social, para que as suas demandas, você pode ver na televisão o que aconteceu é, no fim de semana, para que as suas demandas possam se concretizar. This sounds like a consulting assignment. You know that I cannot answer all these questions. But let me, offer, let me share with you how I think about these questions. Um, the, the way I, um, there are three things I want to say. At Virginia Tech, neoliberalism is washing over the university as it washes over all universities everywhere. I have colleagues in the humanities and social sciences who resist, who critique, and who believe and make the case that the university as a site for cultural and um, ontological creation is disappearing. I disagree. Rather, I think what we are experiencing is a challenge to redefine and explain in new ways the value of what we do. So if one is in a language department or in the social sciences, political science, we face a challenge to reformulate what we do in new ways. Because the va um, I view the academy not as a place where the, we compete to produce an ultimate state of truth, nor do, uh, is it a place that serves entirely as a consulting operation for whatever do is dominant in the present. I view it as a site, uh, a, a collection of projects that compete with, that have constituencies outside in many directions and compete with one another. There's competition, always competition, but competition to make a difference. And so for your project to win, mine does not have to lose. So the first response is that, is that we have to take on the challenge of redefining, of justifying to other audiences. Critical participation is an audience-oriented approach to theory. We have to think through the language, the categories, the images of those that we are engaging. Uh, the example being, for me, what I'm doing in engineering, I'm not, uh, I've been told by my, co my colleagues in engineering studies, get rid of problem solving, uh, replace it with a completely different term. And my answer is, if I do that, they ha will have no idea what I'm doing. And the worst response, the worst reaction to STS work that we could possibly have is silence, which we have too much of. So that is why I formulate an image of engineering as problem definition and solution. That's, a, for me, a creative way of intervening in the dominant image of problem solving without starting with a compound word and trying to, tell, uh, uh, and try to scale it up. Thirdly, privilege. Okay, you, you mentioned the role of governments, um, the uh, policies for higher education, not changing. Um, I would maintain, I would argue that 
um, everyone attending this symposium bears some kind of privilege. I told you earlier I have many privileges, some, most of which I did not earn. Some I earned. And it occurred to me many years ago when I had a postdoc in Washington at the National Academy of Sciences that because I am white and I am male and I am tall and I am an engineer and I have a degree from this school called the University of Chicago, which makes people go, oh, wow, he must be smart. Um, I have, with what I teach my children is that with privilege comes responsibility. So for me, the approach is that people are located in different ways. Some people are working in the government. Some people are working in higher education. So my challenge to all, each of us is to figure out in, in, your, in your local environment what are the operable uh, images, what is taken for granted, what is dominant there. It is as just as I was unable to take on the, in, the entire in, image of technology and transform it through a book. You're not going to trans, it's difficult to transform the, uh, an entire governmental or orientation, an entire uh, set of uh, policies for higher education. But how else do they get changed? They get changed through local, localized, situated interventions that take advantage of the privileges that one does in fact have. So you start with privileges, the analysis of what's dominant, and then creative, clever transformation of critique and anger and sadness and despair into work and that, can, and that can generate maybe you cannot get, the only way to get out there from here is to take a step. So for me, it is always about uh, identifying the direction I want to go, probably out there, and th how to formulate and, and take the very first step. And for me, that means using an, an audience-oriented approach that identifies dominant images, formulates alternatives that others, and then test it. Among, uh, through participation, tested out among engineers. I was invited to Glasgow to speak to, to 500 chemical engineers, and I tried out this image of engineering as problem definition and solution. I was a little bit afraid, but at the time I was affiliated with the National Academy of Engineering, I had privilege. So I used my privilege to, with, with these chemical engineers, and they listened. And I was, and the uh, organizer of the meeting came running up to me after uh, the next day, and said he had been hearing uh, many comments on this, and I learned later that my presentation was the highest rated, uh, me, uh, uh, you know, me, uh, co um, session of the meeting. So localized, situated intervention is all we have. It seems to me, S multiplying ourselves to the best of our ability thinking about dominant images and, and formulating our critiques in ways that make it difficult to reject us. Professor Gary, muito obrigado por sua conferência. Gostei muito da sua conferência, fiquei muito feliz, especialmente é, porque o senhor começa a sua conferência é, tratando de um filósofo muito importante, Antônio Gramsci, né, para... Justamente, eu acho que o pensamento do Gramsci e eu acho que na sua palestra, por, no fundo, está isto, né? Gramsci foi alguém que escreveu sobre o conceito de hegemonia e sobre as possibilidades da contra-hegemonia. 
E quando a sua pergunta que conduz a, toda a sua exposição é... Ok, nós temos que nos bater contra este modelo hegemônico, linear, do determinismo tecnológico. Justamente tá, está aí, né, e acho que nesse aspecto o, o Gramsci nos ajuda muito, quando ele diz, ok, nós temos um pensamento do determinismo tecnológico, do pensamento linear, mas nós podemos ir pela nossa atividade, apostar na, na construção de uma concepção e prática contra-hegemônica, que se faz no cotidiano, no presente. Então, acho que é, realmente é muito oportuno trabalhar com esse conceito para a, a, a pergunta que você nos coloca. E nesse aspecto é que eu gostaria de dizer o seguinte, quer dizer, a contra-hegemonia, ela é algo que está ali latente, vivente. Né? No Brasil nós temos, nos últimos anos e décadas, experiências muito interessantes de construção contra-hegemônicas. Por exemplo, a ação do movimento dos trabalhadores rurais, trabalhadores do movimento sem terra. Ou as práticas de economia solidária. Ou mesmo o desenvolvimento de tecnologias sociais em, ainda que poucos é, é, programas né, é, CTS aliados às comunidades. Então, eu quero crer não é, que é, é, esse conceito de contra-hegemonia, mas com uma contra-hegemonia que se faz na prática também. Um outro conceito importante que está associado ao filósofo Antônio Gramsci, e que me parece muito pertinente para tratar do CTS, é a questão do papel dos intelectuais, como intelectuais que se vinculam a um projeto social, a um projeto de construção contra a hegemônica, ou então se situa no campo da hegemonia. Era apenas ressaltar a importância dos conceitos de Gramsci para justamente tentar reaproximar aquilo que o senhor pontuou do afastamento da tecnologia para com a ontologia social. Obrigado. I went to Gramsci because I wanted to follow the concept of hegemony. I went to Gramsci because I wanted to follow the concept of hegemony. Because it's used in a fairly narrow way. The hegemonic is equated to um, domination, is often equated to domination of group, by group, over group. And I was, uh, I wanted to understand the, 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 the more developed way in which Gramsci uh, articulates and describes the operations of hegemony and then challenges to hegemony and then what ha lies after hegemony. I came to this, I, uh, I came to this through Marxism Uh, and a dissatisfaction with Marx's image of life after the revolution. What is life after the revolution? I don't get it. Hegemony, what's life, what's life after the challenge to hegemony? What I found in Gramsci, and I used to have the page number in the English translation, what I found in Gramsci is that the hegemonic is not necessarily bad. In other words, in uh, the view I have come to, and, and wh what he was arguing is that, is that the working classes need to develop a new hegemony. That's more or less a quote, a, a paraphrase of his, of his argument. Develop a new hegemony. What does it mean to develop a new hegemony? Because every, 
hegemony, every, in my terms, dominant images, no image captures everything. Every image makes some things visible and hides others. There will always be something subordinated by dominant images. Every hegemony sub produces subordination. But not all hegemonies are the same. So let us say that writing in prison that uh, Gramsci successfully mobilizes the masses to scale up a new hegemony. The way I often think about this, I need to write it so I don't forget. The, the way I often think about this is through the image of e inequality. For me, so what is the biggest problem in the world today? In the, in the US, it's always fought out between left and right. Is the biggest problem Freedom is the biggest, on the, which is the right, is why we need to have, everyone has to have six guns. Um, or is the biggest problem inequality? I fall on the si this side. This, the biggest problem in the world is in inequality. And, and I see value then in scale, and in, in, in intellectuals, we side point, we have to have intellectuals. We have to have people who are paid to theorize. So we cannot allow the academy to disappear. But we can't have a, 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 um, a backward looking, a reactionary image of the academy. The German model of the, of the early 19th century University of Berlin um, no longer applies. So that's why I was arguing earlier that in each field we need to re-justify ourselves given the, wa the washing over us of neoliberalism. But back to inequality, I can imagine, can you imagine a world in which we have successfully, this is what in a way socialism, the dream of socialism was about, scaling up a dominant image that could have the effect of reducing dramatically inequality. And if we successfully dramatically reduced inequality, I could ima imagine my own interest shifting to something else because inequality is now, the new hegemony produced something else as subordinate. And I would shift my attention to that. So my argument is, um, and, and this is a problem, this, this is what one of, the thing, one of the things that troubles me about the dominance it's, it's an ending now, but the dominance of constructivist theory in, in STS. Because from my point of view, every, analysis, every, every event of analysis, every event of critical participation necessarily takes place in the presence of, of dominant images, of hegemonic, uh, of hege uh, um, hegemonic images of realities that are given, that are taken for granted, but are, 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 um, um, but are limited in the sense that they produce subordinated perspectives as well. So the issue is not how to eliminate hegemony. It is how to eliminate this hegemony, this hegemony, this hegemonic perspective that I find um, uh, to, to, through my critical analysis, to hide these practices. And, and you just gave good examples. I mean, I followed uh, the, uh, the, uh, the events of the summer in Sao Paulo and elsewhere, you know, ac across Brazil. And there, uh, in every country, there are you know, many ways in which, especially neoliberalism is making and uh, is subordinating um, uh, perspectives in new ways. But for me to dream of a world without hegemony is to imagine the Marxist world at, after the revolution, it, I, it doesn't have substance. So I place, uh, my view is to get anywhere we have to start here. We start with some hegemonic perspective that's with subordinated perspectives which we make visible and then we formulate alternatives and, and then compete to scale them up. I am competing with the image of engineering as problem definition and solution because I believe 
that if this image scaled up among engineers, engineers would have to accept that there are other people out there who have different kinds of knowledge and have value. Because learning engineering problem solving tends to predispose engineers to divide the world into two parts. Those who know, which is me, which are us, who are engineers, and then everybody else who don't know things. And the world is not in two parts. And if, if they believe that engineering is problem definition and solution, then the world has many parts with many perspectives and many different kinds of expertise and then many different kinds of knowledge, both among engineers, I'm speaking too fast, uh, both among engineers and beyond engineering. So I am arguing that for, the, uh, for this image to scale up and become hegemonic, knowing that the, its achievement will produce new subordinations. And if this works, I will shift my attention and become a critic of the, of the image of engineering as problem definition and solution and work on ways of formulating alternatives that, uh, and, and scaling up something to replace that. During the era of postmodernism, we often talked about par partial theories. A par it's a partial view, a partial image that I always found resisted the notion of partiality. It seems to me that every theory is total, is totalistic, but not equal, uh, but with different imp implications. So, um, regard so I found in Gramsci the uh, assertion that hegemony is not necessarily bad. This one is. Let us formulate and try to scale up another one that addresses those problems, knowing that it will in turn uh, um, raise problems that others, other intellectuals who are paid to theorize, paid to critique, and hopefully engage in crit critical participation to challenge and scale up. Without that, if we don't have the academy, if we don't have people who are paid to theorize, and if we don't, and if, and if academics stop at publishing and sitting back in their offices and waiting for the followers to come, um, if any of those, those happen, then we're in more trouble than we are currently, that we will be in more trouble than we are currently in.